Hi everyone, thank you, thank you so much for joining. We'll start in a few minutes. Okay, I see some people still uh, joining. Okay, so thanks again for joining us. Uh, my name is Uri Goren, and I'm a chief data scientist at ArgMax. Uh, ArgMax specializes in recommendation systems and ad optimization. And recently we got a lot of demand from our customers to talk about multi-arm bandits and contextual bandits. Unfortunately, I haven't seen a lot of sources, a lot of videos trying to gather all of the information together into a, a clear curated video. So hopefully it, it would be beneficial also for you and your business. And this is our agenda for today. Uh, we would not dive into the details, into the statistical details, the programmatic details, but just to give you a glance on how bandits fit into the A-B test, B testing ecosystems and what are the benefits of using bandits com in compared to A-B testing in your use case and in your business. So we'll start with covering the use cases. Uh, all of the three main use cases use cases that we would cover are real use cases from our previous clients in which we, we've demonstrated um, great benefits from using bandits in production. Then we would cover the basics of experimentation and A-B testing, and we'll transition into multi arm bandits and contextual bandits and how they fit into the picture. Then we'll describe what models, what machine learning models and deep learning models could fit in a, a contextual bandits framework. And then we'll summarize. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with the bottom line. I guess that the reason that you're all here is that you heard that uh, contextual bandits can help you shorten experiment time. And that's very true, both from our experience and from other uh, relatively big companies such as HubSpot and Expedia reporting all the same results. So we can personally attest that we've been able to save more than 60% of ad spend using contextual bandits compared to A-B testing. Uh, some example use cases. So the first use case that we would cover uh, is essentially optimizing a landing page. So landing page, I think that a pretty general landing page, generic landing page would look something like that. You have a tagline over here. You have a call to action button. Uh, you can control for the colors, the background color, and the colors of the text and sizes. And usually you have some kind of a hero image or an, a figure. This could be an influencer, depending on your industry, or any other, any other art. Uh, when trying to A-B test uh, such an orchestration, such a landing page, there are many parameters you can fine-tune and, and play with. Essentially, you can change the headline depending on your customers. You can change the call to action uh, position, color, and size. And if you try all of these uh, options head-on, you'll soon realize that there are simply too many alternatives to test. Even if, we, if there are just two options for the headline, two options for the color, two options for the background color, and R, we are still left with two times two times two times two, which is essentially eight alternatives, even for this really simplistic example. And as you can imagine, usually there are more alternatives than two, and there are more artifacts that we want to test than just the, the one listed here. And if you try to take into account not only the landing page itself, but also the funnel, where the users come from. Do they come from Google search or Facebook? And if they come from Google search, 
uh, what keywords were advertised, maybe for each uh, keyword campaign you would like a different headline, and all of these things matter a lot. So trying to take also the context and the landing page creative into account at the same time is bound to explode combinatorically into a very large number of uh, alternative and variants. And even if you have a lot of traffic, this could be very, very hard to get significant results using traditional A-B testing. The second use case um, we cover is a recommendation system. Now, Argmax started its way as a recommendation system uh, company, and we gradually transitioned into experimentation in general. But we can, we can um, essentially define a recommendation system as the following problem. We have a lot of items, and those could be movies, if we're talking about Netflix, those could be ads, if we're talking about an, an agency. Those could be songs, if we are Spotify, for example, or articles. And we have a lot of users. Now, users differ from one, one, one another, right? They have different profiles, different age groups, different interests, and we have limited space. We want to use our limited space into, and to curate the items that are most likely to interest our users. Right, so if we have like thousands or thousands of movies and we have um, 10 user profiles, we try to, to, match, to match them together and rank them according to the most uh, likely order. And hopefully, um, if we rank properly, that the most likely item to be clicked or watched would be on top. And as the user scrolls down, uh, she sees different experience. A major problem with uh, recommender systems is called the feedback loop problem. So let's assume that our user is uh, Mickey Mouse and he really likes uh, figures of, uh, of himself, right? So at day number one, he sees these ads, these items being displayed and he brought and he buys the first uh, product. The next day, our recommender system uh, recommends another a toy, another doll um, of Mickey Mouse. And gradually, a recommendation becomes very, very boring. A lot of Mickey Mouse uh, dolls, which is problematic, especially if there are um, new trends, right? For example, the one day Mickey Mouse uh, really discovers the whole uh, goofy experience and uh, really wants to buy a, a goofy doll it would not be displayed. And this is true, we can all think about what happened during, for example, the COVID pandemic. No one ever, uh, I think that the population who bought face masks were very negligible, and all of a sudden this trend suddenly appeared. So we do need to account for uh, uh, these kind of uh, trend shifts. The solution for uh, these kinds of uh, feedback loops is usually to assign in a random bucket or an exploration bucket, which is a bucket. It usually is uh, recommendations that are listed uh, down below, so not the top recommendations, uh, in which we try different things and try to identify new trends. For example, on recommendation number three, four, etc., we can show goofy dolls. And maybe we can identify this trend uh, on a shorter time scale. Uh, this is a good, a good point to uh, mention the exploration and exploitation concepts. So exploration, ex exploration and exploitations are two core concepts that are at the heart of uh, understanding uh, multi on bandits and contextual bandits. Uh, essentially, exploitation is anything that maximizes or increases our sales at the moment. So we can recommend items like the most popular or items that are previously bought or previously bought together. And exploration is our random bucket or exploration bucket in which we're trying to expose the user into new uh, experiences or products 
that uh, she wouldn't have uh, otherwise discovered. And this is a crucial part in any recommender systems. Uh, we need to be very careful with recommendation with exploration, right? For example, this is a recommendation taken from uh, Netflix, right? So I think that this recommendation demonstrates uh, very clearly the need to identify the context or the user profile. So if my user profile is a child, then probably I wouldn't want to recommend the human centipede. Centipede, um, and we need to be careful with exploration and to do it uh, to do it intelligibly. Our third use case uh, regards pricing. We had a lot of experience in real-time bidding. So, real-time bidding. Every time you go into a website or launch an app, there's an auction going behind the scenes, and you are the item of the auction. You are the subject of the auction. People try to bid uh, how much are you worth to them according to the ads that they have in stock. There are three business models. Uh, the first one being a CPM, which is essentially the, the, the participant in the auction uh, pays for the right to serve the ad to get an impression. Uh, the second model, which is uh, I think by far the most common is CPC. For example, the Google ads are CPC. You pay only for clicks that uh, the visitor clicked on, but you don't pay for the number of times that Google displayed your uh, keyword. And the third one, which is the most expensive, is cost per action. This action could be an app install, or a deposit, or a purchase of an item, or anything that is further down the, the funnel. Um, so most bidders develop a machine learning model that tries to predict given a user features meaning gender age geo a time of day etc etc uh, try to uh, predict what is the click through rate the probability of a click on the specific um, items that he that the bidder advertises so for example if i uh, advertise shaving cream and I know that my user is a, a male aged uh, 20 to 40, they would probably bid more uh, on him uh, if I was trying to advertise something completely different, for example, makeup or something that uh, is more targeted towards uh, females. So this could be also formulated as a recommendation system. But I think that the more challenging part is to identify how much should I bid. So given that I know that I want to bid at that user, should I bid $2, $3? Uh, what's the right amount? This is even more complicated since we're talking about an auction. So even if the user is worth to, to me $10, but I, have, uh, but I know that it is worth to other bidders uh, $2 or less, it would be silly to bid ten dollars so exploration is definitely in need to to get a feel of the market and to know uh, how do other bidders value uh, that user okay so that uh, sums up our uh, intro of the use cases and now we'll talk about a b testing 101 so the, the basic statistic concepts without A-B testing and why it should work or shouldn't work and what are the shortcomings of A-B testing. Okay, so essentially an A-B testing scheme looks something like this, right? We have uh, visitors coming from a web traffic or any other uh, traffic source. And we try to split it uh, equally between, between two buckets. The A bucket, which is usually the control, like my current landing page, for example, and a B bucket, variant B, which is essentially some modification. And we're trying to measure what is the, how significant or how beneficial is the new version. For example, changing the button from green to red, etc. So seems very simple and straightforward, right? So what could, what could go wrong? So actually, 
a lot. Splitting the data is not as trivial uh, as it seems. Uh, we had a client that was serving uh, traffic from uh, the United States. And he had two servers, one on the East Coast and, uh, and one on the West Coast. So what could be uh, easier than just having one version of the website uh, cached and served on the East Coast and the other on the West Coast? Any ideas? Any ideas what could go wrong? Right. So by splitting according to geography, even though it's, it is very easy technically to just log into the servers and deploy the different versions, we introduce another variable. For example, maybe people react more to a version A of the website because of weather or any other things, real estate prices or any other features that uh, correlates with geography. So we want our data, our traffic to be split as a uh, as uniformly and as randomly as possible. Another possible uh, issue when trying to uh, split the data is called contamination. So let's assume that I every time I get a visit to my website, I randomize a number between uh, 1 and 10. And if that, that number is even, then the visitor gets a version A, which is the red apple. And if that number is odd, then the visitor sees version B, which is uh, the yellow apple. So simply by refreshing the page, I could see every time a different version. And that, that effect is called contamination. And it really makes things hard when you're trying to analyze traffic and the effect of each version on events down the line. Because if the user seen two, version, two versions of my landing page, and then she purchased the item. Was it because the first one, the second one? We have an, an, an attribution problem going on, and it's, it is not trivial to resolve. And I think that the most uh, challenging uh, issue or aspect of uh, A-B testing is time. How long should we run an A-B testing? And obviously, there are business consequences because the longer we run an experiment, it means that we lose more money on the inferior version. And people get to be very rightfully impatient with the experiments. On the other hand, ending an experiment too soon is essentially flipping a coin. So you really need some patience when you run. A a-B tests. So let's try and get some kind of intuition uh, or a, a grasp of uh, significance with, uh, I think, the textbook example of a, a coin flip. So I'm flipping a coin for uh, several times and I'm counting the number, the, the number of times a coin lands on his head or, or in tail, on, on, on its tail. So as we can see on the first row, the coin was flipped twice, once on his head and once on, on its tail. And I'm trying to, to identify or to answer the question whether the coin is fair or biased. I don't think you can get any clear answer, significant answer by flipping the coin on it twice, right? So even though it seems like pretty 50% for each side, it's not a number we can do anything without. And the more, uh, as I continue flipping the coin, the difference become more, becomes more and more significant. So to sum up, we do get an intuition that we have two things at play here. The first one is the number of uh, trials, the number of coin flips. The more coin flips I have, the more certain I can be. And the other thing I have is the ratio between the head and the tail count. Um, if the ratio is very close, maybe I'll need more coin flips. And if the ratio is uh, very clear, very, uh, very close to zero, I can be very certain even after a, a small number of coin flips.
This experiment is uh, commonly known, is formally known as a Bernoulli experiment. And a Bernoulli experiment is actually pretty, pretty useful. So it's not just about uh, flipping coins, but it's also about analyzing clicks. So instead of having a, a coin probability or a coin flip probability, here we have a CTR, a click-through rate. And this is how we typically get a report from our customers of uh, the results from the experiments. Right? We have the number of uh, clicks on the green version, the number of impression, impressions on the, on the green version, and same goes for the purple version. And usually we want to end the experiment as soon as possible because it costs us money. Right? We have an opportunity lost here. So in these two uh, variants, we have 2,000 impressions during the day. And if we try to analyze what is the CTR at a given moment at, at each hour, we see that the purple version beats the green version most of the time. Now, this is a bit uh, confusing. And it is also known as the Simpson paradox. Uh, because if we sum up all of the impressions and clicks, we would actually find out that the CTR, the click-through rate for the green version is actually way higher. Now, this is because the number of impressions is not exactly the same. And this is not a toy example. It actually happens quite a lot when analyzing uh, traffic, web traffic. So in this uh, specific example, we uh, would actually need the entire uh, time span between 5 and 1 p.m. in order to identify which version uh, works best. So let's try and analyze uh, the results uh, more formally. So in order to identify whether the results are significant or insignificant, uh, what we try to do is we formalize two hypotheses. The first being the null hypothesis, uh, which means in simple word that the color doesn't really affect the click-through rate. On the other hand, we have the green hypothesis, uh, which assumes, which states that uh, the green version is better. First, we calculate the probability uh, of a click, the CTR, uh, regardless of color, and we get that the probability is uh, 3.5%. And then we try to uh, see what is the expected number of clicks given that probability. So this is the formula for a binomial experiment. I won't go that much into the details, but I will say that um, we are looking only on one half, only on the right uh, red part of the distribution, because we do assume that the green versions should be better. So we can actually sum up the probability density and identify what is the likelihood of actually having the the result explained with null hypothesis. So I did a calculation for you. And for example, given the, given the null hypothesis at one o'clock, we do, it's pretty likely uh, to see um, the result that we've seen. Right, there's 87 percent. So the data could be explained with the null hypothesis, meaning that the color, the hypothesis that the colors do not matter, seems pretty likely at the moment. Now, as we move on, we see that um, since the CTR here was pretty low, also the hypothesis that the colors do not matter also seems pretty high. On the other hand, five o'clock, as we've seen before the trends kind of flips, the trend, the trend uh, reversed. And we can see that it is very unlikely to explain this observation with the null hypothesis, uh, which means formally that we can reject the null hypothesis. Right, so the formal uh, notation is that the results seem to be statistically significant that the green version uh, is different than uh, the other version. 
Now, p-value are important and they do answer the question whether the difference is significant or not, but they do not tell the whole story. For example, let's assume that I had uh, this uh, scenario. I had uh, 1 billion impressions and there was a difference in the clicks, but for example, uh, in one version I had uh, 1 million clicks and in the other version, the green version, I had uh, 1 million plus 100. So the difference is definitely significant. If we were to run a, P, uh, a formal Bernoulli experiment and calculate the p-value, it would be very, 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 very small. But the difference is not that important when we try to evaluate the effect that it would have down the line on our revenue, it would be very negligible. So this difference between the CTRs, the click-through rates, uh, is also known as an effect size. And every time uh, you see a, a p-value being reported, you also need to ask yourself, what is the effect size? Because the difference might be significant in p-value, but very insignificant and negligible um, when counting the effect. So p-value is one of, I think it's the only concept that got uh, so much uh, press and actually got like a formal publication from the ASA, the American Statistical Association, on how to use it because it is very tricky to understand even for statisticians. So obviously also for the rest of us. So we need to be very careful when using uh, p-values and when presenting p-values um, in business context because they are very commonly misunderstood. On the other hand, uh, we have um, another way to do A-B testing, which is called uh, Bayesian A-B testing. And unlike classical uh, hypothesis testing and uh, p-value, Bayesian A-B testing try to connect both the effect size and the confidence level into one number, which is also known as the credible interval. And it tries to answer what is the probability, for example, of the CTR being 1% better? So a sample, uh, this, is, this graph is done on a simulated uh, data. As you can see, the more observation that we have, the narrower our confidence gets, right? Because there's um, the, the probability density is being more uh, centered around the true CTR or the true uh, coin flip probability, uh, which means it makes it very simple to reason about. Right? We don't need to explain what is the p-value and what does it matter and the hypothesis. Is. Uh, you can just answer the question and say like, there's a 10% chance that the CTR is better by some value um, that we care about. And we can use that 10% to try and estimate uh, revenues in the future. It's, it's much more easier, not much more simpler to uh, communicate and to reason about than uh, classical A-B testing. And Bayesian A-B testing is essentially one of the cornerstones behind multi armed bandits. Most uh, multi armed bandits use uh, Bayesian statistics in one way or another. So let's try and build some intuition uh, regarding uh, A-B test, regarding multi armed bandits and how should we use them and how do they help us uh, shorten experiment time. So let's assume that we have five variants, right? And we start by um, splitting the data uniformly between all of them. Each variant gets 20% uh, of the traffic. After um, for example, in an hour, and we see that the black variant performs better, right? It yields $3 revenue and the others yield $2 or less. What we would like to do is not to end the experiment because it's been only one hour and it's, the results are not significant enough, but maybe to uh, change the splits such that the black version, the black variant, uh, gets more traffic. So after 
uh, one hour, now the black version gets uh, 40% of the traffic. Uh, the blue version that uh, that yields uh, $2 gets more than the version that doesn't uh, yield um, any money. And on and on, until finally we converge. And empirically, uh, convergence is way faster using uh, multi bandits than just uh, naively looking for a statistically significant p-value uh, using classical A-B testing. Okay, so some notations. Um, the multi bandit concept is named after uh, the tale of a gambler going into a casino and seeing a lot of slot machines. Slot machines are also called one or bandits. And the gambler wants to find the best slot machine, meaning the machine that uh, actually gives um, more reward than others. So we assume that each slot machine has its own internal probability or internal CTR, but the, observation are, but the observations are also noisy. So what the gambler needs to do is he needs to play with all the machines and try to evaluate the true uh, CTR, the true probability. The more he plays, then the more accurate uh, his predictions are. But on the other hand, he did lose money during this, uh, this game. So there's a balance between exploration looking at other uh, slot machines, and exploitation. So in our context, arms are essentially experiments or variants, and the reward is what we get back. We can um, formulate the reward as one if the user clicked, and zero if uh, she didn't. And most uh, multi bandit strategies rely in some way or another on Bayesian statistic uh, concepts. And this is how the results or the traffic splits look dynamically when analyzing a multi bandit at action. So for example, here we can see that uh, the light blue version was the best. It gradually gets more and more traffic as time passes on. Okay, so we see that uh, bandits are essentially reactive uh, split tests and they do achieve between 60 and even reported 80% improvement compared to A-B testing. Um, let's have a short discussion. Do you think there are contexts or there are scenarios in which uh, mutant bandits might not work as well? Right, as I see uh, many of you noting in the chat, it really depends on, on what you are measuring. For example, if I'm measuring um, clicks or something that is uh, immediate feedback, or for example, video uh, being played, then the feedback is usually pretty immediate. And multi bandits are great at optimizing the traffic splits dynamically for immediate feedback. But if the feedback is delayed, for example, churn rate what would be the churn at the end of the subscription of my uh, netflix account then it may take a few months between until you see the result of the recommendation and at these such large scales a multi bandits doesn't really don't really offer any advantage on a b testing okay um Another challenge with multi bandits is what about context? For example, I have, uh, I'm displaying the same ad from, for users from Japan and users from the United States. Uh, the culture is completely different and we need to account for that, right? Maybe certain colors are more popular, certain graphics, uh, certain wording. So multi bandits uh, are not really suited for dealing with context. Uh, which brings us to the topic of uh, contextual bandits. Uh, now, recommendation could be seen as essentially a, a bandit 
um, setting, in button settings. So formalizing a recommender system uh, as a bandit uh, problem, what we have is we have user profiles, which is essentially the context. What is the age group, what country, etc. And what we're trying to experiment with is the items, for example, the movies that, we're, that I'm going to recommend for the users. And the movies with the highest probabilities uh, will get shown on my website. And this is essentially uh, what Netflix uh, is doing, at least according to this uh, great lecture that they had. Um, okay. So let's talk a bit about contextual bandit, because as we've seen, context uh, matters a lot, especially in recommender systems. And there are essentially three strategies into dealing with a context. The first one is to completely uh, duplicate and clone our multi on bandit and to have one bandit per context, meaning that I have a multi on bandit for, user, uh, for users from Japan and multi on bandit for users from the United States. And it gets even more complicated than that because maybe I would like to split my data on multiple features. Uh, one multi-on bandit for users from the United States at ages uh, 20 to 30, etc. Then we have similarity bandit and uh, a full-blown contextual bandit. Uh, so let's try and look how a uh, multi multi bandit looks like. Right, so we have two different uh, experiments going at the, the moment, two different settings. And while those two splits those two segments essentially do share some commonalities, right? They're both in the same age group. Splitting the context like that uh, does not uh, reflect that uh, resemblance. So the next uh, possible solution is to have a similarity bandit. And let's assume that I know that users from New York uh, in that age group are 80% similar to users from California. And that's a big question, how do I measure this similarity? But let's assume that uh, we all agree that this is the similarity uh, rate. Then every time I see a click on a landing page, for example, or on an item in New York for that uh, age group, I can feed 80% of a click to my uh, equivalent uh, segment on California. This allows for some information transfer between those two uh, parallel segments, and it also um, shortens experiment times even more. On the other hand, if you calculate the similarity, uh, if you miscalculate the similarity, then also the results would be uh, very severely affected. Um, the most common formulation of contextual bandits is with a machine learning model which looks something like that. So let's assume that I have uh, four variants of my website and I have a context marked in X. Context could be age groups, country, uh, time of day, uh, a device, mobile device, etc. This context is being fed into the model and the model outputs a probability. What is my probability of watching the video or clicking on the ad or any other action? Then, um, we do not choose the most likely action, but we sample in proportion to the confidence of the models. Uh, this has a, a huge advantage that we are open to exploration, right? So even though that the purple version seem most likely, and uh, sorry, that the black version seem most likely, the purple version uh, is not that far off so it would, all, it, would, it would be also shown to some users in some proportion. So that enables us to avoid the feedback loop and to explore. Then once we have a, an action, uh, for example, the user clicked or uh, any other positive action, we retrain the, the relevant model with the result. Okay, so what are the requirements? for a machine learning model in order to be 
uh, useful in this uh, setting. So there are two uh, main requirements. The first one is that the model needs to support incremental learning meaning that we are able to do online learning in this setting. Um, models like logistic regression, for example, um, are very well suited for this uh, constraint. This is also known as a, as a partial fit uh, for SKLearn SK users out there. And the other um, requirements that we have is that the, the model should be able to predict the probability also known as predict proba in SKLR, but to predict the probability well. And this might be a, a bit more uh, challenging. So uh, we, we need, uh, you, uh, machine learning practitioners will, will need to calibrate the probabilities because these probabilities would affect the sampling later on. All right, so this is very well uh, denoted in this uh, diagram over here. Um, so let's just, let's discuss what models can be used. So for example, three models like XGBoost, for example, do not have an online learning or an incremental learning setting. Every time you train an XGBoost model, you need to retrain it uh, from scratch. So three models are usually more problematic with uh, bandits. Um, but for example, uh, linear models such as logistic regression or naive base are a great choice in this setting. And is deep learning a good choice? Well, yes. Uh, deep learning uh, essentially supports incremental learning by just having some more gradient steps. So we got uh, we can check that box. It also supports a fuzzy prediction, right? So it outputs probabilities. But we need to be careful with that because in a typical uh, neural architecture, you have a softmax at the end. Uh, you need to, to be very cautious about using the output of the softmax because the value on the softmax layer is not a probability. It is not a probability distribution. But there are solutions. For example, this uh, paper by Yarin Gal on how to use a dropout as an estimator of calibrated um, probabilities, class probabilities in classification settings, which is be uh, being used uh, quite a lot for uh, contextual bandits. So it is not trivial to extract um, probabilities, but it's, it is definitely uh, doable and very useful. Okay, that brings us to the end of uh, our talk. Just to summarize, a uh, multi on bandit and contextual bandits are a great way to personalize your website. You can take the context into account. It makes convergence um, faster. And it also kind of solves the exploration exploitation problem because it takes into account exploration and it helps us avoid feedback loops. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about contextual bandits, uh, smart experimentation frameworks, and other things that are uh, faster and more personal than A-B testing, uh, please uh, do uh, contact us at argmax.ml. And thank you. If there are any questions, then, uh, now it would be a great time.